Welcome to the Rochester, New Hampshire History Podcast, a monthly show that will shine a light on a piece of history that has been all but forgotten. This is the intersection of Portland Street and Salmon Falls Road. This unassuming connection of roads does not appear to be extraordinary. However, for a brief time in 1913, the eyes of the nation were riveted to this spot as an infamous murderer found his way into Rochester and stopped here. Our story begins in 1906 with three rich and famous people from New York. The first is Evelyn Nesbitt, who was a young and beautiful model. She was America's first pinup girl and was on the covers of many magazines. Evelyn was the most photographed woman of her time. Harry Thaw is the next player in this affair, and he was married to Evelyn. Harry was an heir to a multi-million dollar fortune and had a long history of mental illness. He was known to be very jealous of his beautiful wife. The last player in this triangle was Stanford White. He was a very successful architect who designed many famous buildings in New York City. He was over 50 years old and several years earlier had raped Evelyn Nesbitt when she was a teenager. Stanford was a member of the Sewer Club in New York, a meeting place where the rich would get together and commit debauchery on young girls and boys. Since he was rich and famous, he avoided arrest and prosecution for his wrongdoings. On June 25, 1906, Harry Thaw and his wife, Evelyn Nesbitt, was at the rooftop theater of Madison Square Garden. In spite of the suffocating heat, Thaw wore a long overcoat, which he refused to take off. It just so happened that Stanford White was also at the same place. Harry Thaw, who knew about the rape of his wife, walked up to Stanford White, He pulled out a gun, which had been hidden by his coat, and shot him three times in the back and head, killing him instantly. Thaw stood over White's fallen body and yelled, I did it because he ruined my wife. He had it coming to him. He took advantage of the girl and then abandoned her. Harry Thaw went on trial for the murder of Stanford White. The trial was a national sensation and became the trial of the century. How could it not become a popular event? Everyone involved was famous, and there were lurid details of sex and drug use. Harry Thaw was seen as a national hero who protected womanhood by killing a rapist. The first trial ended in a hung jury. The next trial, Harry Thaw was found not guilty by reason of insanity. He was sent to a New York State hospital for the criminally insane. Thaw escaped the hospital in August 1913 and fled New York in a big black touring car. This was big news, and everyone speculated where Harry was going and when he'd be seen again. Harry and his driver made it to New England at breakneck speed. Eventually, Thaw drove into Rochester, where his car developed mechanical problems. Harry Thaw's car finally broke down at the corner of Salmon Falls Road and Portland Street. Thaw knocked on the door of a big farmhouse owned by Rochester farmer James Corson to see if he could leave his car in Corson's barn for a few days. Mr. Corson refused, for he had no room in his barn, but found a neighbor willing to put it in their barn for $2.25. Thaw then asked Mr. Corson if they could purchase food, but he refused that request as well. James Corson helped Thaw to get to downtown Rochester, and there Thaw had lunch at a Hanson Street restaurant. He then walked across the street and boarded a train that was heading to Canada. Afterwards, Corson saw a picture of Harry Thaw in a newspaper and realized he had just helped an infamous murderer. He called the police and they inspected the New York car which had an empty gas tank and a missing spark plug. Regarding Harry Thaw, he successfully made it to Canada where he was identified as an undesirable alien. Canada wanted nothing to do with Harry Thaw. He was taken out of the country and released into Vermont. He was soon arrested in New Hampshire and was kept in Colebrook. New Hampshire's Governor Felker received an extradition order to return him to New York. Harry Thaw's lawyers filed many legal challenges to the extradition. Thaw remained in New Hampshire until 1915, where he ran out of legal challenges and returned to New York as a fugitive from justice. In New York, Harry Thaw got his freedom. He was acquitted on conspiracy to escape. Many witnesses from New Hampshire probably including James Corson, testified that he was not crazy. 
Thaw was found to be sane and was released. The good times for Harry did not last, though. He just could not stay out of trouble. In 1916, he was found guilty for whipping and beating a young man. He again was found insane and went to an asylum. He was released in the 1920s and stayed out of trouble for the rest of his life. He died in 1947 at the age of 76. Evelyn Nesbitt divorced Thaw in 1916. She stayed busy in the 1920s, starring in silent movies and working burlesque shows in the 1930s. She died in a nursing home in California in 1967 at the age of 82. This ends the podcast. If you have any questions or comments, please email bobgriffinpodcast at gmail.com. And come back next month for another episode of Rochester, New Hampshire History.